Hello, friends, and welcome to the Wisdom for Life broadcast. This is Pastor Glenn with another episode that we hope will bless you. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, I'm sorry about the game last night. We, we can still have church, though, right? Come on. Yeah, we need it, man. We need it. You are the church. Hey, listen, here's the deal. How many of you are watching the second quarter? And, and do I have this right? Sean Wade, come in for that, for that big sack, that big play. Do I have it right? And, and uh, they, said he, they said he lowered his head. He lowered his helmet. And they took the quarterback out, man. I mean, it was brutal. I mean, that guy was, I was in pain. I was hurting watching it, man. And it, it, it was. He, over, he overstaged that whole thing, didn't he? Very dramatic and said, thanks, honey. And, uh, but anyway, he took his head off. I mean, I mean, he hit him hard, didn't he? And then the coaches ejected him from the game. Or actually, the refs did. How many of you know you can't beat the refs? You might be able to beat Clemson, but you can't beat the refs. Come on. I mean, that's how it is, man. You know, my son-in-law's in, in with me, and you know, I grew up an artist and stuff. I don't know much about anything when it comes to athletics, but I like to watch. My son-in-law even got up, and he said, that's a bad call. That's a bad call. How many of you know? He's a good man, isn't he? Hallelujah. God bless you, Adam. There he is back there. And my little daughter right there, my, my little baby daughter, Lindsay, Lindsay V. Hill. Hi, Lindsay. We love you. God bless you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, pray for me this morning. I'm, I'm, just, I'm feeling a little, a little you, know, you know what that's all about. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're talking, about, <clears throat> we're talking about living a headless life. Living a headless life. We want to go into the new year connected with the head. Jesus Christ, man. We want, to have, we want to have our... Hey, listen. We want to keep our head in the game. Cooler heads prevail. We want to, we want to, have, we want to have a perspective that understands... That we're not running around like chickens with our heads cut off. Come on. If, if, if your life is, is constant, chronic cycles of running here and there and everywhere and going crazy. Hey, listen, do you know you've got a head? You've got a head and it's Jesus, man. It's Jesus. And Israel, at the point of this, this text, is running around like a chicken with its head cut off. How many of you have ever seen that? I grew up on some farms that... Okay, so you go into KFC and you don't know what goes on behind the counter, right? There's something that goes on behind the counter that you don't want to see. You just want to pay for what happens on the other side of the counter. But, but that head's got to come off before that you can enjoy that fried chicken, come on. Or Lee's famous recipe or Popeye's or whatever. I don't like Popeye's too much, though. Popeye, you know, I, but I like KFC, come on. So... How many of you know, running around with your head cut off is no way to live? And this is what Israel's doing. It has a spiritual head. It has some spiritual influence that God has appointed. His name is Eli. Eli means up high. The problem is, is somebody stayed up high and never brought the word of God down low. The people were not receiving a revelation. And you're about to see in just a moment, the Bible says that this was a season when a word from God and a revelation from God was rare. I believe we live in a season like that today, where we, we have gone too long without hearing from God, where we've gone too long without a revelation from the Lord, and that is a big sign of headless living. It certainly is. Take, take a look at verse 1 here. The boy Samuel, Samuel means the Lord heard me. Well, if the Lord heard, well, somebody must have spoke to the Lord. Who was it? His mama, Hannah. Hannah means grace. She prayed for a son, and if you remember the story, she prayed and she prayed and she prayed, and Eli came along. Eli wasn't serving God the way he should, but he was in charge. How many of you know people that are large and in charge? Big hat, no cattle? You catch me? He had, a, he had authority, but he wasn't walking in any type of spiritual power. He comes along and he says, Hannah, are you drunk? You must be drunk. Because the way you're praying and the way you're reaching out to God... You must be intoxicated. Maybe that had something to do with seeing his boys, Hophni and Phinehas, intoxicated, sleeping with the temple workers, getting fat off the altar of the Lord, not serving God. Maybe that's what he was used to seeing, that anybody that would be in the house of God didn't have their head on straight. If anybody had their head on straight at this time, it was Hannah. She continued to pray, and grace produced a child. And the child's name is God heard. 
And if God hears, he's also about to speak. And he begins to speak again in, in Samuel, but he's not speaking through Eli. We're going to find out why. It says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, help me this morning. Because God, I'm just, I'm just a man. But God, you're the mission. God, you're the message. God, you're the might. God, you're the one that can reach down into souls, encourage and touch and lift and bring us out of places, God, where we don't need to be. Reconnect us this morning with the headship of Jesus Christ. Give us purpose, God, for 2020. Give us 2020 vision, God. Speak, God. And may we be oracles of God and speak, God, on your behalf. When you speak to us, may we open our mouths and our lives, and may we share the truth and love and enjoy, not just to Finley, but God, throughout Ohio and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 1945, Colorado. I'm going to tell you a really gross story. It only takes, it's only going to be gross for about five minutes, so just stay with me. Really gross story. 1945, Colorado. The name is, watch this. <laughs> this is good. Anybody ever name your, your animals? You don't name the ones you eat, though, do you? Sometimes you do. You, that's cold-hearted. How do you, if, you name, if you name your cow and you know it, come on, that's cold-hearted. You develop a relationship with names, right? <laughs> 1945, there's a chicken in Colorado. He's an important chicken. Because he lived 18 months without a head. Now, you're going to look this up later. You're going to say, Pastor makes all this stuff up every single Sunday. He comes in here and he tells us all this stuff. He makes it all up. His name's Miracle Mike. They named him Miracle Mike. But he didn't get a name until after they were about to eat him. See, it was supper time. This is a true story, man. Supper time. They even got black and white pictures and video of, of Miracle Mike. That's disgusting. This is getting weird, isn't it? But anyway, it was supper time, so they went out and did what you do. you got to remove the head, and then you got to remove the feathers, and you're going to have, have chicken dinner. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. And so they deal with Miracle Mike. They take the head off, but somehow they just cut it just above the brain stem, and there's one ear left. Okay? And so he runs around with his head cut off for another 18 months. They take a little eyedropper, and they fill it full of... Uh, crushed up corn and, and water, and they drop it. This is gross, isn't it? Some of you are like, why did I even show up for church today? He lives another 18 months. <laughs> I'm sorry to overwhelm you, C-section. I heard an, oh my gosh. And then he finally dies. But he lives, he lives, for, this is cruel. This is, this zombie chicken lived for 18 months with no head. And we, we look at that and we say, you know, that's gross and that's something that I don't want to identify with. Hey, by the way, I don't know if they ate him later or not, but I wouldn't be eating that. I'm not into zombie chicken. I, anything that's lived headless, I don't want. Come on. But, but for 18 months he lives this way. And, and what is this? Is this is this Finley Farms? No, this is Freaky Farms. This is craziness, man. And and what they did was is he he died and, and they buried him. I, I don't think I don't suspect they ate him, but but I wouldn't want anything to do with that. And then I, I, I take a look at I take a look at my life and I say, you know, um, I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to be a chicken with its head cut off. What is it? Eighteen days or eighteen months or will it be eighteen years where I'm physically engaged? But there's actually no point, no mission, no direction, no purpose. Everything is just running around in chaos and tyranny of the urgent. We just sometimes we get caught up in this situation where the devil wants to knock our heads off. And then what, what do we do? We end up in, in responding just to, to emergency. We end up responding. We don't live proactively. We don't live our lives anymore with vision. The Bible says this was a time where vision was rare. And then I look later in my Bible and it says this, the people perish for lack of vision. 
I don't care if you've got activity. Sometimes busyness covers emptiness. Just because you're busy doesn't mean there's any point to your life. Unless the headship of Christ is directing you, you could be all over the map and not be in God's will and not seeing the fruit of his spirit and the blessings that you should have in your life. It's just chaos. It's not Christ. And listen, this morning, if I'm going to crucify anything, I'm going to crucify that chaos mentality that says this morning, you need to live your life chaotically. Listen, another scripture tells us this, that confusion is not of the Lord. I will not be confused in 2020. Hey, I may go through some things, but I'm going to be a chicken with its head. Right? Come on. I'm not going to run around with, with a chaotic mentality. And I'm not going to be confused. I'm going to keep the headship of Christ in my life. You see, this was a time in Israel where someone should have been proclaiming what the head had said. The head would be God, and Eli, Eli would be the communicator or the Mr. Microphone of the time. But he wasn't doing it. He wasn't doing what he should have been doing, especially with his sons. The rest of the story goes like this. He has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They decide they're going to take on the Philistines. And so what they do is they gather the armies of Israel together, and they run out to fight the Philistines. And they say, hey, listen, we know how we can get this job done. Let's go get the Ark of God. Let's get the Ark of the Covenant, and let's bring it with us. Because that's our good luck charm. Listen, God is not your good luck charm. The presence of God is not your good luck charm. Listen this morning, let me ask you a very pivotal question. Are you asking God to bless what you do, or are you doing what he's blessed? Do you understand the distinction? Do you have the discernment this morning to know the difference? Not just asking God to bless what I do, but I want to do what he has already blessed because there is a head and it's not me it's christ he's in charge see sometimes even in our prayer lives instead of making jesus christ a steering wheel he's just a spare tire we put him on the car whenever there's an emergency but if there's not an emergency that's okay lord i'll go ahead and drive jesus is not your co-pilot he's your pilot put him in the driver's seat and don't let the devil ride Because if you let him ride, he's going to want to drive. Jesus should be the one driving your life. Jesus should be the one ordering the next year for you. Ordering your steps because you're righteous in him. Ordering the direction of this church. How many times do you do something, then when it doesn't go right, then you pray? Hey now, just because you can do a thing, doesn't mean you, come on, doesn't mean you should. Are you alive this morning? Come on, I'm heavily medicated and I'm making it. (laughs) Let's do this, man. Let's do it. All right. (laughs) So they go out and they lose. They lose the battle. In fact, 30,000 Israelites die, including Hophni and Phinehas. And the enemy takes the ark of the Lord. A messenger runs back and tells fat Eli, he's fat by now. Don't get all mad at me. The Bible said he was fat. <laughs> pastor, said, pastor said there was a fat guy in the Bible. He's not PC. He's fat. He's a big fat guy by now. You know how he got fat? Off the blessings of God and doing nothing with it. Why wasn't he out there praying and leading that battle? Why wasn't he out there praying over everybody? and lead? He was a priest. Come on. He's fat. So a messenger comes back. He's seated on his throne. The messenger says this. He says, look, both your sons are dead. The whole army's dead. And we've lost the presence of God. Well, listen, the presence of God was already gone. It wasn't the ark that contained it. The ark just represented it. This church building just represents the presence of God. This is not the presence of God. You represent the presence of God, and hopefully you carry it. But you're not the presence of God. He is. So so they come back and they tell Eli, 
Eli sitting on, seated on his throne. He hears this, and the, the news shocks him so much. And this is prophetic. I want you to get this. Hold on to this part right here. The Bible says he falls backwards. And the weight of his own body. Listen, how many of you know blessing can be a burden? If you're this blessed, do I have to, I don't have to demonstrate, do I? If you're this blessed and you're this burdened and the weight of what God has given you has not been put to godly use, that may work against you. I look in the Bible and I see over and over again all these people that God had blessed them and it was at the height of their blessing that they started losing it. In other words, it's almost like in the valley when things are tough, we're closer to God and we're doing what we should be doing. Then we get to the mountaintop again and we forget God again. Here's where he is. He's overly blessed and the Bible says the news comes to him and he falls off of his chair and the weight of his own body breaks his neck. In the Hebrew, it's a little bit deeper here. His, his head was removed. And this is, this is something of a picture prophetically of a couple of things. First off is this. There is a, when, when we get to the place of blessing, but we're no longer doing what God has called us to do with it, we need to return. We need to go back. Even in the book of Revelation, God says this. He says, return to your first love. Repent and do the former things. Everybody wants a new thing because everybody's got itching ears. But God says the formula really isn't something that's already been told to you. It's old-fashioned gospel, sound doctrine, truth, baby. Return. But every time you see in the Bible where a head is removed, we see a shift of authority. Are you with me? This happened several times in the Bible, even in the New Testament. We see that John the Baptist's head was removed, and his ministry immediately decreased. He even said that, I must decrease so that he might increase. Jesus Christ, being the head of the church now, is increased, and yet he goes to Calvary. There's another place, there's another word for that place. What's it called? Golgotha? What's that mean? Skull? Are you with me? Skull, head. So the head of the church, Jesus Christ, Colossians 1, we'll see it in a minute. Head comes to head. Gives his life there. But if John the Baptist was killed this way, why, why was Jesus killed another way? Because Isaiah prophesied this. For unto us a child is born, and the government of the world will be upon his shoulders. What's on your shoulders this morning? You can't remove the head because the, <laughs> even in his death, he gave death and hell a headbutt. The head came to the head. Some scholars say that when David slew Goliath, am I going too fast, too far? His head was brought to Israel. Did you know that? Some scholars believed it was buried at Golgotha, why they call it the skull. It not only looks like a skull, it had a very important head there. The seed of the enemy is buried there. I don't know. I read in my Bible in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. There is a shift. It's all about headship. When the devil comes after you, he's after the head. The head. You came into this world head first. I hope you go into 2020 head first. Otherwise, you're breach. The Bible says a lot about headship. And when the enemy wants to knock you out, he's just like, just like in boxing. Most of the heavy hits go to the head. Boxing is won by the hits that are driven to the head. Now, I know Rocky Balboa was great on the body. He did a lot of body work, but stay with me. Some of you are like, I don't even care about Rocky. You should. You really should. See me after service if you want to know who Rocky Balboa is. I've got all the movies. We'll get you discipled. <laughs> when the devil wants to knock you out, he wants to knock you senseless. He gives you a headbutt. He wants to knock the head off. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Rock'em Sock'em Robots. I got it for Christmas one year. And, and the whole point was to remove the other robot's head. 
The whole point in spiritual conflict is the enemy wants to remove your head. He don't care about your heart. You know, that's the problem. Most of the time when we're going through things, we want to we want to talk about our heart, how we feel. You know, listen, God cares about how you feel, but the devil don't. Stop telling the devil how you feel. He doesn't care how you he has no feelings. All he wants to do is knock your head off. He wants you to run around chaotic. He wants you to be confused. He wants you to have your steps disorganized. He'll take your head off. That's what he wants. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, Jesus never said, listen, feelings, nothing more than feelings. He didn't say, you know, devil, this is the way I feel. You know, it's, I haven't eaten in days. Now, this is the way I'd be at home with my wife, okay? I'd be hangry. You know what hangry is, right? It's an emotional reaction to, okay, you got it, and you want to eat. So he didn't say, you know, I haven't eaten in days. And you know, and you know what, devil? <laughs> Pastor didn't even say hi to me this week. I didn't come to church for two weeks and nobody's called me. And you know, it's tough out here, man. Hashtag the struggle's real. <laughs> this is terrible what I'm going through. I want you to see his headship. He came at him with the word three times. You know, he did. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth. Where's the mouth? What you're getting from God comes out of his mouth, from his heart, but it's coming out of his mouth. You need his word more than you need sympathy. Come on. You want God to feel sorry for you, but he wants to make you a victor, not a victim. He wants to rise you up and challenge you and fill you with his spirit. He wants to make you a champion. And you just want him to feel sorry for you. Now, he'll listen to you. There's a lot of psalms that were written that way. He'll listen to you. He'll love on you. But the, the end of the story is full of glory. He wants, he wants you to live with purpose and intention from his word. He wants, you, he wants his son to be your head. Now, interestingly enough, there's a, a young lady. It's the daughter-in-law of Eli. She is pregnant with a son during this time in the story. And uh, the news, as it comes to her, goes straight to her heart and past her head. She doesn't have the knowledge, and she doesn't have the truth, and she doesn't have the spiritual headship in her life to protect her from the news that's to come. Listen, there will be a day in your life, trust me on this, I love you, I'm not trying to be weird, but there will be a day in your life where, where you will hear something that will knock your block off. And if you're not careful, it has shut you down. And, 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 and if you don't go, return to the headship of Christ, your feelings alone will have you running crazy. She heard this news too. Her reaction was a little bit different. She went right into labor. She produces a son, but it kills her. Some scholars say the reason why it kills her is he's born breach. I don't know, maybe this message is about head this morning. And headship. Maybe this is about leadership. Maybe this is about the preeminency of Christ. Maybe it's about the role of God in our lives as the leader. He's not our, uh, he's not our additive or our ibuprofen. He's not our, he's not our buddy or our pal. He's our Lord. He's our director. He's our master. He goes before us and we follow. We are followers of Christ. Amen? So, so she produces a child. And what she does is really, um, really interesting here. Um, she stamps her future legacy with the present. And she confesses that out of her mouth by calling him Ichabod. She says, in the moment of his birth, which kills her, by the way, she stamps her future legacy. Now, if... If you're old enough, you know what I mean by legacy. There's a certain point in your life where you've lived long enough that now you're starting to live your life through the lens of the people around you, your children, your grandchildren, your spiritual sons and daughters. Listen, this, I'm almost there. Next year I'll be 50, but I'm telling you, my life now, the only thing that matters to me are the generations. I want to have a legacy lean. I want to lean into the people around me and make a difference in their lives. It's not about building my life or myself anymore. 
When you reach a mature moment in your life, now the only thing that you're counting anymore is the generational blessings of God. She stamps the legacy, her son, with the name Ichabod. Ichabod, as you know, means this, the glory has departed. The interesting and irony thing here, the ironic thing here is this. He lives long enough to see the glory return. She had spoken something over her future that was only temporary because she lost her head. Mm. This head needs a drink. A water. Some of you are already... Gosh. Lord, I pray for him right now in the name of Jesus. The glory returns. It's some 40 plus years later, but it returns. And it returns under David. He's alive to see it. He would have been old enough by then to see it. He's probably not dead. And so what she had spoken over his life was only temporary. And yet because she had lost her head, she stamped a moment of a temporary moment and made it permanent. And that's what feelings do. That's what it'll do. That's what emotionally led people will do. I don't care. Yeah, you know the Savior. You know God. You're, you're walking with the Lord. You'll make it to heaven. Probably with your britches smoking, but you'll make it. But in the meantime, there's all this chaos. All this stuff coming out of your mouth. All these things happening. And the world doesn't see Jesus. It doesn't see Christ. It sees the chaos. That's what happened, man. Emotions and feelings got the best of her. I've done it. You've done it. Man, I've done it in Walmart parking lot. If there's ever a place to do it, you'll do it there. I mean, you ain't even running the store yet. You know what to do it to me? I'm not lying. Because I know some of you are more spiritual than me. God bless you, you bunch of saints. You're awesome. But here's a big one for me. When I'm walking, you know what those signs say up at the top? One says out, one says in. Come on, Linda, you know. Do you know what's... <laughs> okay, back to the notes. <laughs> Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body. Who's the body? You. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning in the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything, in everything, he might have supremacy. He is the head. He's the leader. He has direction. Where does direction come from? The head. What does the head do? It takes in input from the entire body and then makes decisions to the rest of the body. And when those decisions come, sometimes they're sacrificial. Let me give you a couple of examples. When your head's on straight, here's a couple examples. Number one, imagine this. Imagine this. You're going into 2020. It's January 10th. It's already been nine days past your New Year's resolution. You walk into your kitchen, and there's Reese's cups. And the body says, eat five more of them. Or there's Oreos, eat a whole sleeve. And the head says, come on. <laughs> Let me give you another one, because this is for church folk. Church folk, you got to get this here. You're, you're hanging onto the side of a cliff. No better, better, better one than this, because you'll never see a cliff. I never will. This is Ohio. It's flatland. Better than this. You're in gym class, and you're climbing the rope, right? You ever do that in gym class? They had that thing when I was a kid, like, for the, do it for the president. You know, they had presidential, you could make the president's lift, list or whatever. I was a big, fat, chubby kid. I got up like three feet and fell. You climb up the, you climb up the rope, right? Your body is saying, is straining, and it's saying, I need to let go. But the head is giving direction. Now, not all of the body is straining. 
So you come into the house of God, and some of you, God is calling to do this, and he's calling you to do it sacrificially. And then you look at another part of the body, and you're looking at them, and you're saying, well, I don't see any strain in you. And, you know, you get this little hater thing going on. Well, aren't you like me? Shouldn't you be doing what I'm doing? Hey, listen, not every part of the body is the same. And not every part of the body is going to respond to the head the same way. Yeah, listen, how can you say that you're part of the body and not give? And I'm not just talking ties. I'm talking about serve and, and be connected with, with serving others and, and blessing others. You, you, it's kind of an ironic thing, but did you know that it, somewhere between 10 to 15% of all the calories you eat go straight to the head? And then we say the word tithe. Okay, that's a way homer. It's 10%. Goes to the head. You say, Pastor, that's you. No. Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. In, in, in Revelation 21, 6, he's called the Alpha and Omega. So listen, the head completes only what he begins. Don't ask him to be the Omega if he wasn't the Alpha in the decision you made. Well, God, I want you to finish this because I started it. Who's the head? The head only perfects what he authors. Hebrews 12, 2. It says this, he is the author and the finisher or perfecter of our faith. So if God didn't author it, why are you asking him to? Come on. So we understand that connection with the head is what gives us our sustenance, our life, our direction, our purpose, our blessings. Let me give you just a couple, just, just two or three before we leave, of what life looks like and what it could be better if you're connected with the head. Here's the first one. It's in these boys' names, Hophni and Phinehas. You know about Hophni, right? Hophni's name in Hebrew means pugilist. Now, that's an old, like, that's an old English word, pugilist. Uh, pugilists were the original prize fighters. You know, you kind of... You kind of see the, the pugilist was the guy that you'd see on kind of like the, uh, some of the sides of restaurants and stuff. You can still see them today where they've got a boxer, boxing shorts that come down to like the ankles. And, and they've got both their fists up like that. That's a pugilist, a prize fighter. But another word is, is quarrelsome. Quarrelsome. He, this is a guy, Hafni was a guy who loved to get into fights. And listen, he was supposed to represent the Lord. He was, he was one of the priests. He was his father's son. He was supposed to be teaching people the right way. And I, I just want to tell you something this morning. If you go into this next year quarreling with people all the time, you're disconnected from Christ. That is, a, that is proof positive. If you've got a quarrelsome spirit, if you're bitter, if you're angry, if you're constantly messing with people, or if you're a drama mama, or Papa, level it out here. But look at this. Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant, quarrelsome controversies. You know they just breed fights. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach and patiently enduring evil. And in Romans 12, 18, if it be at all possible with you, live at peace with all men. If it ain't peaceful, don't put it on Facebook. We don't want to see it. You're, you're a Christian. You, you represent peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Peace has to be made. Peace don't just happen. You're the peacemaker. You need to be the one that comes into the situation and says, wait a minute, cooler heads prevailed. I'm the one that's got a head on straight here. Listen, everybody, chillax. Take a chill. You're the one that comes in and brings life and, and calmness and sweetness and kindness. Listen, man, I, I want to tell, tell you something. 
It's very rare that you'll see me. I used to be a fighter. I used to be a, even as a pastor, I used to be a pugilist. Somebody, you know, whack-a-mole? You ever see that game, whack-a-mole? That's the way my ministry used to be. So anybody that stick their head up and be like a, an idiot or something, I'd just play whack-a-mole all day, and I'd try to hit all these. You know what? After a while, that stinks. You know what? I'll let God mow the lawn. I'll let God take that out. I'm just going to love you. And, and, and if you're going to be a jerk, I'm going to love you being a jerk. You won't like that. Did you know that's worse? When somebody loves you while you're being a jerk, it's worse than if you were to give it back to them. All I'm trying to do is, I want you to win. No. <laughs> so that's what he says. He says, we're not to be anything but peaceful with everyone. How about this next guy? Phineas. His name means brazen mouth. Why did Eli call his boys this, these names? I've got a son. His name's Isaac because I wanted him to be laughter. And he laughs and laughs and laughs. What his name means. Who names their kid brazen mouth? <laughs> you shall be brazen mouth. You know, it's a, no. And the idea here was is this son... He'll be a fighter. He'll start fights and he'll finish them. And this son, can you see the attitude that's in this head? And, and, and then he says, and my next son, he, he'll, he'll say all kinds of things with his mouth. He'll finish the arguments. He'll be brazen mouth. That's headless living. Proverbs 13, 3. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens it comes to ruin you ever just laid your head on the pillow at night and just said i wish i hadn't have said that it's just me like there's a whole list it's like why did i say that that's like every sunday night after i preach <laughs> i'm not kidding you i actually go over some things with my wife i'm like should i have said that and a lot of times she's just like well <laughs> yeah you know what the bible says later we could see the rest of his heart the bible says later that his sons were out of control for samuel three thirteen, and he restrained him not he didn't do any he didn't start the lawnmower you, you know what i'm talking about he didn't discipline him he didn't correct him a, a surefire sign of headless living is you don't want the truth and you don't want to be corrected you've got a brazen mouth and you want to be quarrelsome and you just want to start fights with people. And you just want to be mean to people because of everything you've been through. And listen, you're not the only one. Everybody else has been through it too. But you'll never know how much they love you and how much they care about you because, listen, you need correction. It's just as simple as that. And you're not going to pack a church with sermons like this. People don't dig this stuff. They don't want to hear it. That, I mean, listen, they want the blue light special on truth. They want it cheap and fast in their way, like Burger King. You can't have it that way. When, when the truth comes, you've got to change to the truth. You conform to it. As simple as that. And so listen, listen, you, you, want, you want a connection with the head of Christ and he's in charge? Well, then you become like the head lived his life. He wasn't brazen with his mouth. He wasn't, he wasn't quarrelsome. How many times do you see about Jesus? You know, they picked up stones or they wanted to fight with him and the Bible says he just, he just walks away. He just walks away. And, and, and we, don't, we don't see this, this attitude where he's got he's to argue with people and be upset with people all the time. And yet, the, the simple words that he did say in love changed my life. 2,000 years plus later, changed my life. It was enough. I'm his legacy. And he didn't, he didn't call me Ichabod. <laughs> he didn't call that. He didn't speak that over me. He, his words are life to me. And I'm living into everything that he said over my life. But I also want to speak the same over you. I want you to have peace. I want you to have joy. And I, I want you to have great relationships. Not argue all the time. And I, and I, I don't want you to be brazen mouthed. <laughs> I want you to love people, man. He didn't, re, he, didn't, he didn't deal with his sons the way he shouldn't have. The way he should have, sorry. And then finally we say this. 
This connection with the head is, is revealed in a lack of revelation and a word from the Lord. Listen, God is always speaking. But, but if he never says another word, what's in the Bible is enough. You've got enough right there. 66 books. He'll speak to you. All you've got to do is be still and say, Lord, I'm, you know, I'm humble. I, I, I'm the clay. You're, you're the potter. Change me. Use me. Make me into the image of your son. Speak what you want to speak into my life. And, and, and he will. You, you can always have a word from the Lord. You, you, you didn't come here this morning to have a word from me. You, you need a word from the Lord. And, and, and the Lord, when the Lord speaks, listen, listen, it's so important.